Hi everybody, this is Stefan Molyneux from Free Domain Radio. I hope you're doing well. South Africa kind of vanished from the news for the last little while for reasons that I think will become abundantly clear during the course of this presentation. When I was a teenager, this was a huge topic. What were we going to do with the racist apartheid regime? Should companies disinvest? Should there be boycotts? Should there be sanctions against the um, apartheid South African government? And then 1994, the transition to Nelson Mandela's leftist uh, African National Congress occurred. And after 1994, vanished from people's consciousness. Well, I'm here to bring it back. Let us circle back to the um, significant transition in South African history and see what has been going on in South Africa now that it has been under black rule for 20 years and officially desegregated for close to 30 years how are things going so let's start with just a little bit of a view of the population as a whole so uh, from 1960 to uh, 2014 well there was a huge increase in the population of course uh, from a little under 20 million to well over 50 million now this is not homogenous uh, population. Of course, there are four major groups within South Africa, the blacks, the whites, the mulattoes or coloreds, and the Asians, so, which often include the uh, Indians. So Gandhi, of course, practiced law in that situation as well. And so the number of blacks and coloreds within South Africa keeps increasing. The white and Indian population is significantly on the decline. According to some estimates, by 2025, the black population will increase by 5 million from the current 40 million the white, white population is going to fall by approximately 350,000 to a little over 4 million. So to put this in perspective, in the post-Second World War period, when apartheid was being instituted in 1946 and so on, whites were about 20% of the population. By the 1980s, they were down to 16%, and uh, in a decade or so, they would be down below 9%. Now, under apartheid, black population, the population of blacks, increased enormously. It more than tripled in the period between 1946 and 1991. Now, under black rule, the population of whites has been steadily declining. Another fascinating fact, if you look at life expectancy, in the early 1940s, the life expectancy for blacks was 38 years old, compared to close to 80 in America in the present day. Now, from the 1940s to the early 1990s, it rose by 23 years. It went from 38 years average life expectancy to 61. Under black rule since 1994, it has plummeted by nine years, the average life expectancy of blacks. Let's look at the demographics. Uh, South Africa, of course, is um, almost 80% black. It's 8.9% mulatto or colored, 8.9% uh, white, and 2.5% Asian. Now, in the 1960s, um, South Africa was growing, as it did through the apartheid regime, the economy grew by about 3.5% a year. That's very good. <laughs> that gives a significant boost to your income over time. And the share over time of the black proportion of the economy and its wealth was increasing, and the whites was actually decreasing to some degree. In the 1960s in particular, South Africa was growing at a rate second only to that of Japan. Yes, back when Japan actually had uh, economic growth. And uh, some people have compared the peace and security in South Africa at the time to be similar to that of Switzerland. More recently, of course, global financial crisis of 0708, South African government has cut interest rates to a record low. Naturally, this generates a borrowing boom which in turn boosts the country's gdp that wonderful solution how did it work out for america or weimar republic or post-revolutionary france or pretty much everywhere else that it's been tried well it never actually works well i guess it works like cocaine works for a toothache in the short run but you end up with two problems where before you only had one in the past decade south africa's gdp has risen by 38 percent but private loans have increased by 225 percent this is created a situation that economists call a credit bubble and everyone else calls ah since the country's gdp is further quote boosted by rampant government spending one of the reasons why the value of gdp as a measure has been called into question the actual 
economic growth relative to the expansion of loans may be a lot worse. Yeah, government hires a bunch of guys to dig in a ditch and fill it in again. Well, that's called a boost to the economy. Get into a car crash. Boost to the economy. Oh, we'll be talking about that too. South Africa's policy of lowering interest rates requires an expansion of the money supply. Interest is the price of money. If you want to lower the price of something, you've got to increase the supply. That further devalues their currency. Ah, providing people with goodies. Hey, we don't have to raise your taxes. We can just print money or borrow or sell bonds. The same three legs of the unholy stool of government predation. So let's look at the uh, currency of South Africa, the RAND. <laughs> Ironic, I know. This is the change of value relative to gold from 1960 to 2015. And for those of you who are just listening to the podcast, you might want to check out the visuals. For those of you who are watching the visuals and think it takes too long, just download the podcast. The sources, of course, as always, are below. I forgot to mention that earlier. So here you can see the US dollar, eh, you know, bumped up a little bit with QE666, this quantitative easing, which is not just a friendly laxative, but a way of wallpapering the entire future with money and then setting fire to the house with children inside. You can see here the South African Rand has gone through the roof. This is like the happiness spike of um, some crazy person on lithium or who forgot to take their lithium. This is what is happening to the South African Rand. The value of gold has increased nearly 570 times relative to the Rand and only 33 times relative to the US dollar. So it's rapidly turning into toilet paper. The quarterly money supply in billions of dollars of South African rands, Q165 to Q1 2015. Well, as you can see here, it began to rise with the uh, economic and racial troubles of the 1980s. And uh, then, of course, uh, after the ANC got into power, they get to do what socialists do. They start printing and borrowing and spending. So the value of the rand has fallen 546 times relative to that of gold. During the same time period, the amount of the rand circulating in South Africa has grown 561 times. See, those numbers are quite close. That is not a coincidence. You print a lot of money, each, each one gets worth less. So this has resulted in massive inflation. Inflation, actually, of course, is the printing of money, the creation of money, uh, excess money relative to goods and services. The money, uh, the price of increase of goods is just the effect of that. So here you can see the key inflation measure uh, consumer price index 1960 to 2014, uh, fairly flat. And then uh, there's been a 72-fold increase in prices since 1960. Of course, all normalized for all of that. So it's not good. Relative to the United States, a fairly steady line. And uh, on the top, uh, we just have the uh, screaming death ride to the stars of insolvency. So What's going on with the family structure? Well, you know, when there's a lot of government spending, there tends to be a lot of welfare. A lot of welfare tends to disintegrate traditional families and create the giant welfare state known as single motherhood, which produces a lot of dysfunctional children. So who do children live with in South Africa? Well, just over a third live with both parents, 39% with the mother only, 3% with the father only, and 23% with neither parents. Now, of course, you have to break these things down by race. Um, less than a, one third or 29% of black children live with both their parents. But the vast majority, a uh, high 70s uh, percentage of Indian and white children live with their biological uh, parents. And um, that is uh, significant. So even after you know two decades of, of black rule, we still have that same level of dysfunction where black families tend to be single mother-headed and white and Asian families tend uh, not to be uh, single mother-headed. How is uh, education doing? We really wanted to, uh, I wanted to compare this to apartheid era education, but unfortunately it's all in archives. It's not available online, so um, we couldn't. But where does it stand right now? The quality of South Africa's overall education system, well, it's been ranked 140th out of 144 countries. Its maths and science education is almost dead last at 143rd out of 144. So they followed 1.2 million children that were enrolled in first grade in 2001, but only 44% graduated high school in 2012. Ah, you may ask, what does graduating high school mean? Well, in 2012, annual national assessments revealed that grade nine students scored 13% for mathematics on average. So graduation doesn't mean that much. You know, when I was a kid, if you didn't get 50 or more percent, you would just get back to year 
that doesn't seem to be happening as much. Everyone's on this conveyor belt of, you're great. Only 12% of those 1.2 million students had grades that were good enough to allow them to study for a South African university degree. And a 2011 report noted that 60% of youths in South Africa are left with no qualification at all beyond the grade nine level. Now, education is one of these key things in the 21st century, of course. As more and more jobs get automated, as computers and robots take over more and more, you need better skills to compete uh, in the global economy. So boy, if there's one time you don't want the quality of education to be declining, it's now, but that's exactly what is happening. And part of this is due to racism on the part of the South African government, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. A report from the South African non-governmental organization network noted, quote, Arguably, the failures in South Africa's education system reflect the problems that have beset governance in the country more generally since 1994, since the onset of the ANC and Black Rule. A lack of skills, monitoring and accountability have led to poor policy implementation, inferior training of teachers and bureaucrats, and a system many people have lost hope in. Those who can afford to are increasingly sending their children to private schools. Here's the unemployment rate. Now, some of these are zoomed in graphs. Have a look on the left-hand side. This is not a zero-based unemployment rate, and zero-based unemployment is uh, pretty much uh, impossible to achieve. So here you can see in 1994, while unemployment was going down, 1995, the ANC, the socialists get in, and socialists are gonna socialize, and uh, the unemployment rate went through the roof and has remained pretty high ever since. Since 1997, three years after the transfer of power to the ANC, South Africa has consistently been in the top 10 of countries with the highest unemployment in the world. According to projections for 2015, South Africa will have a higher unemployment rate than Greece, which is in the more diabetes than Mexico category of not good. What is the unemployment by race? I don't mean to separate everything else out by race, but it's important to because the numbers are so different. Unemployment by race, 40% unemployment among blacks, 8% unemployment among whites. So it's black South Africans who are driving the unemployment rate. So blacks aren't doing well relative to whites in a multi-decade majority black country that is run by blacks. So riddle me that, Batman. We'll talk more about why later. Because fools rush in where angels fear to tread. See, South Africa is not so much a country as is, is it is a giant penal colony of welfare addiction. Back in 2010, economist Mike Schussler claimed that South Africa is the biggest welfare state in the world. And I'm from Canada. That's big. When looking at the statistics, it's pretty hard to disagree with that assessment. Okay, <laughs> only 3.3 million or 6% of the population contribute 99% of all income tax revenue. Beep, beep, beep. Let's back up that data truck and see what we hit on the road, right? 6% of the population contribute 99% of all income tax revenue. When compared to the 16.4 million recipients of social grants, 31% of the population, there are in fact in South Africa, five people on welfare for every taxpayer in the country. And I don't imagine those taxpayers are a lot of blacks. About 20% of South Africans don't make enough to sustain their daily caloric intake, and by far the biggest chunk, 70% of social grants go to welfare moms in the form of child support. So that's not good. Bloomberg in 2014 shone a light on the degree of welfare addiction in the country. Um, one welfare mother was interviewed and said, the state gives the money, why should we? Why should we doubt applying for it? Just think how I would have gotten by with all of these children. The government looks after them. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Get the women to marry the state and you just get a giant economic boom of ah! In South Africa, 71% of children live in households in which no adult is employed. Hmm, I wonder if that's been a bit of a loss of human capital on how to negotiate the job market, how to interview, how to get and keep a job, how to deal with bosses, how to deal with difficult customers, how to manage a paycheck. <gasps> yeah, all of that has vanished. Um, there was a pretty good power grid. I've actually been to South Africa two times, once when I was a very little kid and once when I was a teenager for fairly significant amounts of time. And uh, yeah, it was a very good power grid. First world country uh, back in the day um, and uh, gold backed currency, very little government debt, very little government deficits, um, great shopping malls. And again, 
not racially equal, which we'll talk about in a minute or two, but uh, good power grid. Since 2008, one major issue that's been plaguing South Africa has been frequent power outages. On average, these scheduled blackouts have taken place every third day in 2015. To prevent the power grid from collapsing, ESCOM, the country's sole electricity provider, turns off the power in certain areas, euphemistically calling the practice load shedding as opposed to selective blackouts. How did the South African power grid end up in such a mess? Well, it's not the fault of the ANC. Uh, ESCOM is a public company created by the South African government in 1922. Of course, it's completely divorced from the laws of supply and demand and improvement and free market and competition and efficiency and ha ha. ESCOM holds a monopoly over the country's power supply and little incentive to improve. And of course, because it's government run, they love to build new stuff. It's really not so sexy to maintain old stuff. Give me a new ribbon to cut. I'm happy. Give me some sewage thing or electricity grid to maintain. Uh, doesn't buy me many votes. Company officials and politicians blame the crisis on the after effects of apartheid <laughs> and the decaying infrastructure that is a source of constant breakdowns. But the roots of the problem run much deeper. Huh. Blame Whitey doesn't turn out to be exactly the case. Never seen that before. When the apartheid regime ended, the government focused on connecting thousands and thousands of black households to the power grid. Of course, rightly so, good job. This rapid expansion of electricity demand is supposedly at the root of the current problem. You see, there's nothing worse for a company than more customers. I mean, isn't that expanded demand? Oh, it's the worst thing. Yet. Stop watching this video. I don't want you to be a customer. Ah, the facts are a different picture. In 1994, ESCOM had close to 38 gigawatts of capacity, or roughly half what's needed to power my ego. By the end of 2014, it could only deliver 24 gigawatts, eh, less than two thirds. So the company had lost 37% of the capacity that was inherited from the apartheid era government, even though they've actually expanded their facilities. Population has increased 38%. See, these are two things you want working together. You've got 37% lower capacity, 38% more population, hence blackouts. According to experts, ESCOM loses three gigawatts due to electricity theft and non-payments, but the main issue is management and maintenance. The South African governments continue to bail out the energy giant through cash injections, but its funding gap, currently estimated at 225 billion rands, or about 17.8 billion US dollars, or about half a gram of gold, continues to grow. The company CEO says, we have not maintained our plants like we should. He's also complained about the lack of skilled workers in the country, urging colleges and universities to address this issue. See, they really need skilled workers in Africa. Why aren't they getting any? We'll see. Given that ESCOM faces a shortage of skilled workers, it might be surprising to learn that the company is currently being pressured to fire over a thousand engineers and over 2000 artisan tradespeople. See, when you're having trouble delivering electricity, shedding engineers, it just makes sense. Of course, all of the employees that ESCOM is being pressured to fire are white. The company has to comply with the South African Employment Equity Act, which mandates that employee demographics have to reflect the national demographics, also known as a giant vote of a lack of confidence in the ability of blacks to compete with whites. Because ESCOM employs more whites in proportion to blacks, it now has to fire a large number of skilled workers to comply with affirmative action laws. It de denies that it plans to cut jobs in the short term, still has to affect these changes by 2020, at which point South Africa will go dark. I mean, this is crazy. So the, the demographics are, imagine if the NBA had to fire huge chunks of its basketball players because there were too many African Americans compared to the population as a whole. And therefore we've got to get rid of LeBron James and bring in Whitey McShorty head. If this happened in the United States, that the fans would set fire to stadiums and go insane, but I don't know. It's just whites being oppressed, so fine. And people say, oh, yes, but the whites oppressed the blacks. Well, whites weren't huge fans of apartheid. You know, when I was a teenager, I was offered free university. You know, my dad worked in South Africa as a geologist. A free university. Bit of a problem, though. You also have to be enrolled in the armed forces. So you got to sign up for the armed forces. You get paid $15 a month. And if you don't sign up for the armed forces, you got to spend four years in jail because white privilege. 
you got to remember, separate the whites at the top of the pyramid from all the other whites. Whites didn't like slavery in America either, because only a couple of percentage points of whites owned slaves, and the rest of them had to pay a huge amount of taxes to support the slave infrastructure, and they were conscripted for slave hunting, which they didn't want to do. So anyway, back to speaking of skilled workers and affirmative action. South Africa, hey, got a resume? Want to make some work? Do you enjoy ducking bullets? South Africa currently has an estimated 829,800 unfilled position for high skilled workers in senior management, medicine, engineering, and other technical occupations. Ah, so you think, boy, there's a big giant sucking sound of massive demand. Let's see people fill it. No, but in the five years between 92 and 97, the number of awarded engineering degrees dropped by 13%. Maybe they were powered by electricity. I don't know. At the same time, the number of public administration and social services degrees increased by an astounding 199% because 200% would be too many. So put this number in perspective, the second highest increase was in languages, linguistics, and literature degrees, 40%, because nothing says I can send you electricity in a really functional power grid like the ability to parse out sentences in a Jane Austen novel. So now that the socialists have gotten in power, people say, hey, degrees which lead to government employee employment, they're really quite valuable. In uh, 1994, only 15% of black South Africans occupied skilled jobs. Two decades after the end of apartheid, that number is pretty much unchanged at 18%. So that number should be higher. Less than a fifth of blacks occupy skilled jobs in a country where they represent four fifths of the population, right? Let's just go over that again. Less than 20% of blacks occupy skilled jobs when they're almost 80% of the population. So of course, whites are gonna be disproportionately hindered by affirmative action laws. Unsurprisingly, whites and skilled whites in particular continued to leave the country to seek employment abroad. Speaking of white flight, I saw an albatross. A study of white flight from South Africa noted, quote, it was found that skilled whites are dissatisfied with the majority of the government's performance. They distrust the government and feel that it does not represent them. Skilled blacks, on the other hand, express much more positive sentiments about government. Furthermore, the government's affirmative action policy was identified as another factor influencing the emigration of skilled white South Africans. The results of the survey indicate that skilled whites are strongly opposed to this policy and the arguments advanced in support of it. Only 20% of blacks expressed similar views. Uh, so very brief aside, so uh, democracy only works when the majority uh, government, right, the government that's in power faces a risk of a loss of election in the next, that, that, that way it stays responsive to the people. If a government knows it's gonna stay in power pretty much forever, it stops being responsive to the people and becomes increasingly corrupt. And when you have, uh, as is so often the case in a multiracial or multicultural, society, uh, people don't vote according to the good of the country or according to policies as a whole, they tend to vote along racial lines. Blacks vote for blacks and Muslims vote for Muslims and so on. And um, that's uh, one of the reasons why America has Obamacare. In fact, the main reason that is that uh, 100,000 Somalis who live in Minnesota were ordered by their imam to vote for Al Franken, who cast a deciding vote for Obamacare. They're not voting based upon any understanding of Obamacare. Probably they're voting based upon uh, imam told them to and so on. And so most people who talk about democracy, when you have a disproportionate racial or ethnic group, means you've got to have some sort of power sharing structure. A mere majority rule puts a particular group in power pretty much forever, which makes them incredibly corrupt, which we'll sort of see as we go forward. The study um, summarized the most common reasons why whites would leave. Affirmative action, giving unfair comparative advantages to black job seekers. Decreasing value of the national currency, the RAND, as a psychological factor. Leveling of schooling conditions with decreasing quality in the form of white schools. And rising insecurity due to the expansion of delinquency in previously protected areas. This dodging bullet that we mentioned earlier. So let's talk about some of this insecurity and rising delinquency. Rampant criminality in South Africa is the most common reason for the emigration of skilled people, in particular skilled whites and uh, Asians. Now, murder rates are reasonably good proxy for the amount of brutality within a culture, and this is why these statistics for South Africa are so shocking. Now, the murder rate has officially been going down, whether this is because murders are increasingly unreported as people disengage from the policing process 
who knows, there's some suspicion. But in 2013, the murder rate in South Africa was nearly seven times the rate in the United States. Now, the United States is considered a machete-bladed hellhole of third world crime statistics compared to Western standards, so you're worse than the worst by a significant factor. According to a recent United Nations uh, data, South Africa has the 11th highest murder rate in the world. In the past decade alone, close to 200,000 people have been murdered in a country with a population of a little over 50 million. Over 17,000 people were murdered in 2013 alone. And these are just the official statistics. For comparison, a little over 14,000 Americans were murdered during the same year, and South Africa is about the size of Texas and California put together. Now, the actual murder rate in South Africa might be higher, or a lot higher. According to a survey by the South African Institute of Race Relations, half of the crimes in the country are not even reported. It's been estimated that on average, 50 people are murdered every single day. Additional three murders that go unreported. This would be several hundred murders, 300 or so in the United States proportionally. So this is murder rate per 100,000, the most recent data. South Africa, ding, ding, 31.1. United States 4.6, Mexico 21.5, Iraq 8, Canada 1.5, Australia 0.8, Japan and the UK clocking in at 0.3. So that's a very big red bar. Rape. Look, there are lots of horrible rape statistics, and we've combed through the six ways from Sunday. Lots of horrible rape statistics and uh, perspectives in South Africa. There's one study that says that 27.6% of South African men uh, who have been surveyed self-admitted to committing rape, but um, drunken sex is considered rape, uh, so it's, it's problematic. And we've got a presentation on this very channel, which you should absolutely, definitely, totally check out after this one, that is, called The Truth About Rape Culture, which goes into this in more detail. But a report by the African Studies, sorry, African Institute for Security Studies noted, quote, according to 1997 Interpol statistics, South Africa had the highest per capita rates of murder and rape, the second highest rate of robbery and violent theft, and the fourth highest rates of serious assault and sexual offenses of the 110 countries of which crime levels are listed by Interpol. This is why the country is so often called the world's rape capital. According to prison data, 1.25 million sexual assaults have been reported since 1994, the end of apartheid, averaging to 170 per day. And Interpol claims, hold on to your hats, that only 1% of sexual assaults are actually reported. Okay, so 170 per day, assuming 1% of them, those are the ones that are recorded and reported, we're talking 17,000 sexual assaults per day and 125 million sexual assaults since the end of apartheid in a population of 40 to 50 million. So even if only a fraction of these numbers are true, it's still pretty appalling. So for example, in 2008, a lesbian member of the national female football team died after she was gang raped, brutally beaten and stabbed 25 times in the face, chest and legs. This horrific crime is part of a widespread practice in South Africa, which is called corrective rape, that is supposed to cure people of their homosexuality. Meanwhile, in North America, gay rights activists are really upset because a pizza employee gave an answer to a theoretical question about delivering pizza to a gay wedding. Because that's important. Not the fact that there's corrective, ra corrective rape in South Africa where people get raped to death for being gay. Focus on the pizza. Good priorities. The rate, rape rate per 100,000 in South Africa, 92.9, US 27.3, Mexico 13.2, Canada 1.7, Australia 7.1, includes koalas, Japan 1.0, UK 28.8. Of course, the UK with a high Muslim population has that challenge as well. Um, President Zuma um, in uh, South Africa was tried for rape in 2006 and acquitted of charges that he raped a family friend who was HIV positive. During the trial, he did admit to having unprotected sex with his accuser, but claimed that he took a shower afterwards to cut the risk of contracting HIV. That doesn't work, by the way. There's another African official who said, hey, the best way to cure HIV is with garlic, apparently mistaking the virus for a vampire. 
I'm sorry for this data. I'm sorry for this data. I'm sorry for this data, but we need to unblinkingly stare at some of the darkest hellscapes of the country. So if corrective rape doesn't horrify you enough. Wait, there's more. Baby rape is a widespread practice. In 2001, Jacob Zuma, back then a deputy president, commented on the issue of baby rape, quote, there is a consensus that there is something seriously wrong in our society. We are still haunted by the news of six adult men having raped a nine-month-old baby. And there are many other cases which display barbarism and moral decay of the worst kind. According to 2004 to 05 police data, quote, children are victims in half of all reported cases of indecent assault and close to half of all reported rapes. One in 10 cases of common assault is against a child and one in 16 murders and attempted murders are of a child. Do you understand this? Children are the victims in close to half of all reported rapes. About 10% of all rapes in the country are committed against children who are under three years old. 10% of all rapes in the country are committed against children who are under three years old. Over 23,000 children were raped in the span of a year, according to South African Police Service statistics. Of course, nobody knows why this horrific practice is so widespread. Some have speculated that it stems from a belief held by many in South Africa that sex with a virgin cures HIV and uh, AIDS. South African Health Minister claimed in 2013 that at least 28% of South African schoolgirls are HIV positive compared with 4% of boys because sugar daddies are exploiting them, which I assume is some synonym for rape. Sex crimes um, against children compared to the total, almost 55,000 rapes, 23 and change against children, almost 10,000 indecent assaults, almost 5,000 against children. HIV and AIDS prevalence, 15 to 49 years old. South Africa, 19.5% prevalence in the population. United States, 0.6, Mexico, 0.2, Australia, 0.2, UK, 0.3. South Africa has 0.6% of the world's population, but 17% of the world's HIV infections and 11% of the world's tuberculosis cases. Non-communicable diseases like diabetes and, and heart disease are rising sharply. From, from 2004, sorry, from... Um, 1997 to 2004, non-communicable diseases rose five-fold, 500%. Another plight that is uh, seldom mentioned is the shocking prevalence of fetal alcohol syndrome when you basically pickle and destroy your child's brain in a steady drip of alcohol through the veins of a pregnant mother. Fetal alcohol syndrome, South Africa has the highest rate in the world. Life expectancy, we uh, mentioned this before. So 1960, in the high 40s, it peaked to uh, 64, 65, just before the end of apartheid, 62.33 to be precise, and then dipped down to 2005 to 51.56. And um, in 1990, HIV, AIDS, and violence accounted for just under 2,500 deaths in the age group 15 to 49 years. HIV and AIDS claimed only about 200 lives in that age group that year. By 2013, there were almost 200,000 lives lost in these categories. And um, one of the things that happens, of course, you, you get the welfare state and you get promiscuity because you don't need to have pair bonding because the government's going to pay for your kids. You can go knock some woman up. She's not going to say no to having sex because the children will become an asset rather than liability. So she doesn't need a good provider and so on. So um, welfare state drives promiscuity, promiscuity drives the spread of AIDS, and um, this is how one government program leads into another government program, leads to a giant graveyard. The United States, as you can see, life expectancy has continued to cook upwards from 70 to close to 80. The police, uh, if you're from the United States, you may have heard occasionally that black people have problems with police enforcement. Let's see how that goes when the um, people in charge and the police are largely black. A researcher at the South African Institute of Race Relations noted, quote, some of the reasons why people are not reporting crimes we found 
there are police issues. People do not report to the police because they feel the police cannot do their jobs or either they are corrupt or inaccessible. The incompetence of the police has proven to be a fertile ground for private security companies. In 2014, there were close to half a million active private security officers in the country. By comparison, there were about 200,000 police employees, so two and a half times. And these aren't like tubby guys swimming flashlights checking on empty warehouses. These are people who pull out their guns fairly regularly. When compared to police force size and total population, South Africa has the fourth largest private security industry in the world. Not only is the private security industry offering security services to private citizens, but also to state organs. And the government doesn't like to use its own police, they hire private security. And this is based on a report. If you drive, if you're thinking of driving in South Africa, don't. Uh, borrowing is safer. South Africa is amongst the top 10 countries with the highest road fatalities in the world, only slightly ahead of war-torn Iraq. The three leading causes of fatal accidents are drunken driving, excessive speeding, and dangerous overtaking. Um, so basically, compared to Iraq, uh, if you're driving in South Africa, it's pretty much equivalent to driving when there are IEDs or improvised explosive devices on the roadside. A black driver speed like crazy in South Africa. If it's any consolation, they also speed like crazy in, in uh, America. Uh, there was um, a kerfuffle um, recently, I guess some years back, about um, blacks being unfairly targeted for speeding. So they checked and they found, oh, look, the blacks were speeding at twice the rate of whites. So um, this may be something a bit deeper than uh, culture. South African drivers are generally very aggressive, lack consideration, and are extremely impatient, noted a government official. Car accidents claim the lives of 32 out of every 100,000 South Africans every year, very close to the country's murder rate. So you can be killed with a small weapon or a very large weapon. It's your choice. It's nearly three times the rate of road fatalities in the US and nine times the UK rate. When measured as a ratio of the number of vehicles in the country, South Africa has over 11 times the death rate of the United States. Annually, traffic accidents cost South Africa $35 billion, or so roughly 10% of the gross domestic product. The cost of human lives is immeasurable. Look at the numbers. Road fatalities per 100,000 vehicles. South Africa, 156.4. United States, 13.6. So let's rewind. How, how on earth did we get here? How did America, uh, South Africa sorry, get, get there? Well, European settlement in South Africa begin, began in the middle of the 17th century. A long time ago. Europeans have been farming South Africa since around the time Newton discovered gravity. The Dutch East India Company commissioned the creation of a colony in the region. The place served as a strategic midpoint on its Asian trade route. So white settlements, generally a government program with a government monopoly being run. Now, the Dutch, Calvinistic, Protestant, very religious, very hardworking, they get up at the time I go to bed, and they're very good farmers, right? They started to settle and farm a land which grew to be about twice the size of Portugal before they had any substantial dealings with blacks. So they were generally expanding into areas that there were no blacks into. So the Dutch were coming in, the British were coming in. At the same time, or shortly before, the Bantus, uh, who were a northern race, a black tribe, the Zulus are a subset of the Bantus. The Bantus came into South Africa. There was a native population of blacks in South Africa, generally more peaceful. The Bantus, the nice term is displaced. The more accurate term is murdered, possibly genocided them to the point where there's very few of them left clinging to the edges of deserts. The Bantus who had uh, iron weapons, which the native blacks in South Africa didn't, the Bantus came in and drove out uh, all of the native blacks and then ran into the Dutch and there were all these wars which we'll get into but uh, the, the the current black population is largely if not exclusively immigrants to South Africa and very similar in a time frame to the Dutch so you have two immigrant populations fighting over land it wasn't just whites going in and displacing the native blacks after the French occupied the Netherlands in 1795 in search of lattes and tulips, the British attacked and captured the Dutch colony in South Africa to secure access to the crucial supply point. Ah, perfidious Albion at work again. There was a Dutch-Anglo treaty of 1814. The South African colony was officially given to the British. 
The Afrikaners, the Dutch settlers in South Africa, weren't entitled to return to their homeland, which was an option for colonists from other countries when the European colonial empires started to fall apart. So that's important. As one author put it, quote, herewith the Dutch finally deserted their kin in exchange for coin. There was no attempt to guarantee Afrikaners' right to residence in Holland or anything of the kind. They were simply sold to the British, lock, stock, and barrel. To this very day, the Dutch do not accept that Afrikaners, despite being their direct descendants, have any right of return to the country that placed them in Africa. Uh, we'll get into actions against apartheid, but a lot of the Dutch countries, uh, Dutch country and, and other countries have put a lot of Hostility had a lot of hostility was the apartheid regime and they put sanctions on and they disinvested from these countries and so on and they really took a giant wrecking ball to the South African economy, which actually harmed the blacks even more than it harmed the whites. And so these countries uh, destroyed significant portions of the South African economy and applied all these horrible sanctions to South Africa to protest apartheid. But they have the highest entry requirements, so they destroyed the country for the white people, but didn't allow the white people to leave and emigrate to those countries. Um, and uh, one listener wrote and said, um, they messed up the country and made it impossible to escape. I've tried America, Canada and Australia. Guess what? The answer was always the same. Sorry, you don't meet our minimum entry requirements. You can stay there and die and we don't care. Have a nice day. Uh, this is very unusual when the British left India, the British who were in India could re return to, uh, to England, but this is uh, not the case. They're trapped there, the uh, Afrikaners. Under British rule, life for the Afrikaners took a turn for the worst. Not only did British missionaries antagonize the black African tribes against the Dutch settlers, but the empirical, imperial media outlets portrayed them in a very negative light. Now, the British authorities benefited from the continual conflict between blacks and whites in South Africa. It's the old British strategy, as all colonial strategies are of divide and conquer. It keeps the Dutch occupied and prevents them from rising up against their British masters. But it's important to understand that there was a long history of race relations, of course, in South Africa, long before apartheid. You just, you just don't bring this stuff up. But you need to understand the historical context of the race relations to understand apartheid. This doesn't mean that, that we say apartheid is right. It doesn't mean that we sympathize or agree with it. It's wrong. It's racist, racist and horrible. But you have to understand where it came from. And it wasn't just pure malice and evil racism. That's just some magical explanation. It's like doesn't explain anything. The British BBC's historical timeline of South Africa completely omits Africa's Hundred Years' War, otherwise known as the South African Frontier Wars. So basically between 1779 and 1879, British and Dutch colonists fought nine wars against neighboring black tribes. These were often initiated in response to cattle theft on the part of the blacks. Look, farmers, not very big on war. You know, they've been up early, they've been working all day, they're tired, their muscles hurt, they just want to go home and have some Jagermeister and a sheep. And um, so you've got this expansion of a, an agricultural society that runs up against a hunter-gatherer society, and there's a lot of conflict. It's happened six billion times throughout history, and um, there was a lot of conflict between the tribes, um, and particularly between the races, which is very common throughout human history, even in the present. Now, another aspect to understand when it comes to figuring out what the driving forces were behind apartheid is not just the fact that that they felt they needed to separate the races because the races couldn't get along, but it's communism. Ah, yes, the C word. So um, very, very briefly, let me just sort of put this in context. So uh, in 1917, the US came into World War I on the side of the French and the British. This created such a disproportionate amount of power that the Germans had to close off the Eastern Front by getting Russia out of the war. The way they did that was they shipped a whole bunch of Jewish communists into Russia, who then fomented a revolution, took over uh, from the uh, Mensheviks, uh, the Bolsheviks, and then destroyed Russia. Um, it was horrendous. And um, millions of people starved to death because communism doesn't work. It's a horrible economic theory and a horrible and destructive and, and incredibly genocidal implementation when you starve to death, right? So. Um, what happened was when the um, communists got into power, they slaughtered millions of Christians because it's very explicitly atheistic, hostile to religion philosophy. So the Bolsheviks got into power and slaughtered a whole bunch of Christians. And so when Christians see 
communists trying to get into power, they feel it's us versus them. This is what the Germans felt when the communists were trying to get into power in Russia in the 1920s and 1930s, sorry, in Germany in the 1920s and 1930s. They thought, well, God, if, they, if the communists get into power in Germany, they're going to kill all of us Christians. So that was one of the driving forces behind National Socialism. A bit of an overreaction, of course. So the Calvinists, the Protestants, they feared communism because of the communist genocide against Christians that had occurred in a variety of countries, in particular, of course, of Russia, in Russia. Here's how one historian describes the Africana relationship with communism. Quote, the image of the Bolsheviks horrified the rank and file Africana, eventually making the latter into probably the staunchest and most consistent anti-Soviet grouping on the planet. The horrors under Stalin sealed the fate of the communist philosophy in Africana minds. It was not so much the socialist philosophy as the total disrespect for religion and human life that created in the staunchly Calvinistic Africana nothing but utter revulsion. Africana saw communism as the prime evil. So that the issue of race and communism went hand in hand for the Africanas is apparent in the fact that the National Party passed the Population Registration Act and the Suppression of Communism Act at the same time. The former was the first apartheid law that formalized racial classification, while the latter outlawed the South African Communist Party and defined communism as any scheme that encourages feelings of hostility between the European and the non-European races. Yeah, let me, um, let me break this out for you very quickly. So communism sucks. Communism is ridiculously bad at predictions. So three basic things were supposed to happen in the communist theory. Number one, communism was supposed to inevitably grow out of late stage capitalism, right? Agrarianism led to feudalism, led to capitalism, led to communism. It was inevitable. You didn't have to lift a finger, except it wasn't happening. That was number one. Didn't happen. So that's why there were all these revolutions, because, hey, I'm tired of this thing happening inevitably. I'm going to make it happen myself. Number two, communism was supposed to develop in the most advanced capitalist countries. Didn't happen because the workers kept doing better and better under the advanced capitalist countries. So they had no interest in communism. This is why communism took place in backwards countries like, uh, you know, semi-feudal uh, Russia and uh, Cuba and uh, North Korea and, you know, god awful places, Cambodia and so on. So that was the second failure. First was supposed to grow out of capitalism. Second, supposed to take place in advanced industrialized countries. Number three is that communism was supposed to vastly outproduce capitalism because communism is unfettered by all that confusing got to make money stuff, no profit motive, it's supposed to be much more efficient. It really wasn't. So communism was having a hard time spreading. Capitalist workers didn't really want it. It wasn't going to be inevitable. And it was really underproducing relative to capitalism, even with all the communist and socialist lies in the media throughout the 1920s and 1930s, the truth sort of came out. And so what the communists did was they said, ah, you see, well, capitalism is racist, racist, capitalism, racist, because apparently black and white means a lot more to capitalists than the color of green or money. So they said capitalism is racist. Now, one of the problems with that, of course, was that under capitalism, even the racial minorities began to do better. In the 1920s and 1930s, the black family was even more solid and together in America than the white family. Blacks were coming into the skilled occupations. There was a growing black middle class. This is very bad for communism because this was their last way to criticize capitalism and the last people they could agitate. They couldn't agitate the workers against capitalism because the workers liked it. So they could agitate the minorities against uh, capitalism, but if the minorities did well, that would be bad, which is why you see people on the left always trying to help the minorities while always making things worse for them, as in the welfare state, which has been incredibly destructive and toxic to black families in particular. So that's something to understand that the communists were openly saying, and we talk about this in the truth about immigration and also the truth about the race war, both available linked below and on this channel, communists go in and start riling up the racial minorities against the dominant majority, whatever that happens to be, in this case happens to be white, the communists come in and start riling up and they want to use the blacks in South Africa to overthrow the white government. So the whites start segregating and having um, racist laws and anti-communist laws at the same time. Plus, of course, remember that the Afrikaners had seen the British rile up the blacks against them and had been horribly murdered and fought against and so on. Uh, and so they knew what was going on. They knew what had happened already, and they didn't want to see it happen again. So there's a long history of violence between blacks and whites 
in South Africa, some the blacks' fault, some the whites' fault, of course. But the communists were actively attempting to turn the black population into a revolutionary force, given that the number of black members of the South African Communist Party greatly increased after its inception, and that the African National Congress, the current rulers and Nelson Mandela's party and so on, eventually allied itself with the Communist Party, is it any wonder that the Afrikaners were suspicious of the black population? Nelson Mandela himself held a senior rank in the country's Communist Party. Um, he was proven to be a member of the Communist Party after years and decades of denial of this. So the parallels between South Africa under apartheid and the current Israeli-Palestinian conflict are very obvious, often brought up by historians and the media. However, no sane person is suggesting that Israel should open up its borders, assimilate the Palestinian population, and give them full voting rights. What would happen in such a situation while well, Israel would cease to exist? Would we expect the Israelis who would quickly become a minority under this scenario to go along with it peacefully given their historical relationship with the Palestinians? Of course not. Again, this doesn't justify things, doesn't make everything right, but context and perspective and history is important. Otherwise, we end up just throwing names and learning nothing. The institution of apartheid was not racism, but was designed to preserve the white population against the increasing communist militancy of the blacks. Quote, for leading thinkers in the National Party, such arguments about racism almost completely missed the point because the security of the Afrikaners as a dominant minority and not as a race per se was what concerned them. The Cape Town Stellenbosch axis of the nationalist intelligentsia, which was the most influential lobby in this National Party, almost without exception defended apartheid not as an expression of white, superior, sorry, white superiority, but on the grounds of its assumed capacity to reduce conflict by curtailing points of interracial contact. When races in human history across the world, when races come into contact, there is a lot of conflict. Ah, the joys of diversity and multiculturalism. It's not just race, it's religion too. Look at the Protestants in Northern Southern Ireland. Look at uh, Bosnia. Look at Serbia. Look at the Middle East. Uh, you can see these conflicts going on all the time. It's race, it's nations, it's cultures, it's religions. We are kind of an in-group preference species. That's kind of how evolution works. And so uh, they thought, well, we keep the races separate, then we can reduce the amount of conflict that is going on. And they set up these 10 uh, tribal areas and they said, we're going to make these their own countries and we're going to put uh, this tribe here and this tribe here and everyone's going to just stop fighting with each other. Everyone go to your separate corners, go have your own countries. And they tried creating what we call Bantustans um, and it didn't really uh, work out for reasons that um, we'll get into a little bit later. So the granting of political rights to the Bantu of the kind which would satisfy their political aspirations was altogether impossible in a mixed community, since such a step would endanger the present position and survival of the European population. If this danger was to be avoided, and at the same time the Europeans were not to violate their own conscience and moral standards, a policy of separate development would prove the only alternative. See, the the Europeans also knew the history of South Africa and knew that the Bantus had wiped out the indigenous population when they first moved in a century or two before the Europeans. And so the Europeans knew that the Bantus were perfectly capable of wiping out a minority that they had strength and superiority over. They knew this history. So they thought, well, majority democracy is going to be kind of suicide for us. Say, ah, oh, well, the Europeans shouldn't have been there. Should the Bantus have been there? They weren't native to the population either. You can play these games forever. It is what it is or rather it was what it was. Now, during apartheid, there was a massive influx of immigrants from all over Africa who were apparently desperate to get enslaved by the racist white man. That white racism, I've got to see it up close. Can I stay? Because boy, you think South Africa was bad. Just look at the rest of Africa. Hey, Idi Amin from Uganda kept human heads in his fridge. What a great leader. Don't see that on the stamp too often. Now, the treatment of blacks in South Africa was steadily improving. The laws of apartheid were being gradually repealed. Beginning in the early 1980s, the South African government expanded democracy by drawing colored people and Indians into parliament, noted a prominent South African historian. By the late 1980s, public facilities were desegregated, racial laws were repealed, blacks were given property rights and were allowed to enter historically white universities. 
This was all done by the supposedly racist whites in charge. A scholar noted, quote, in the wake of some of these changes, the average black income in South Africa doubled between 1979 and 1983. It is true that PW, the South African president, left in place those pieces of apartheid legislation that controlled voting rights for blacks and maintained the homeland structure, but Rome was not built in one day. So let me just give you this very, very brief perspective. The only way for stability to have grown and sustained itself in South Africa was for a black middle class to come into existence. Because once you have a black middle class that came into existence, then you have blacks who are heavily invested in the protection of property, which means that they're going to resist the massive forced redistribution of wealth and the dissolution of the currency and all of that. Because there's an old theory about democracy, which says, if you give poor people the vote, since the poor outnumber the rich, the poor will simply vote to take away the property of the rich and everybody ends up poor. You needed to grow a black middle class. This was happening. It was happening. More and more wealth was being concentrated in the hands of the blacks, less and less proportionately in the hands of the whites. There was a giant shift and the black middle class was growing. And with that, you get stability and the rule of law and an investment in stable property rights and the protection of contracts this process was destroyed from outside against the wishes of the black population as we'll get to you got steve van zandt you got peter gabriel you've got all of these i ain't gonna play sun city ass clowns who come in and start lecturing everyone with no knowledge of the country's history with no knowledge of the delicate balance and how to actually achieve a stable shift in power all coming in screaming racism at everyone. You've got countries out there disinvesting, destroying the economy, putting in sanctions, embargoes, boycotts. This prevented the creation and sustenance and growth of the black middle class. As a result, when the blacks took power, there was not a stable black middle class that provided a ballast and slowed down or even held at bay the transition to socialism, that was the founding principles and purpose of the African National Congress. The opportunity was lost. And you get a nine year shave down on the average life expectancy on blacks. You get massive explosions in HIV and AIDS. You get massive explosions in murder. You get massive explosions in rape, single motherhood, dysfunction, road crimes. But what do the liberals care? They're off to the next thing, the next cause. What do they care? There's 200,000 black bodies because they had to come in and interfere with no knowledge of what was going on. They're sailing off to their next tea party. Champagne socialist assholes. There are dead people. When you advocated for the immediate end to apartheid, without the growth of the black middle class to provide stability in the transition, you have a lot of blood on your hands. Black lives matter. Between the mid 1970s and 1995, the black share of total personal income nearly doubled from 20 to 37%, which resulted in a decline for the white income share from 71 to 49%. That's 20 years. Another 20 or 30 years, it could have all turned out differently the goddamn communists and the leftists and the liberals all had to get involved and scream racism at everyone, collapse the economy, destroy the emerging black middle class, and return it back to tribal crap fest 101. 12 years into apartheid, right after the Second World War, the literacy rate of the black population was already the highest in Africa and even higher than India. This would be after 100 years of British colonial rule. South Africa ended slavery half a century before, almost half a century before America did, because it's a colony, right? The British ended slavery in the, I think, 1832, ended slavery in England and all the colonies and spent a lot of blood and treasure ending slavery around the world. Slavery 101. I've got the truth about slavery. It's a presentation here. Slavery 101. All human societies everywhere across the world, all throughout history, all practice slavery. 
The earliest records that people can find are generally slave transactions. The earliest cave paintings are slave transactions. Slavery was everywhere and always the human condition. White, Western, Christian, Europeans ended slavery, particularly the British, in the 19th century. First culture to do it, they made it universal. First culture to not only end slavery for themselves, but to end slavery around the world. Moral crusade, one of the great achievements of humankind. White, Western, Christian, European men ended slavery. Who are the only people now blamed for slavery? White, Western, Christian, European men. Which only goes to show, if you ever want to be hated by the world, do something good for it. No good deed goes unpunished in history. So, the end of apartheid coincided with the end of Soviet interference in, Af in Africa, in South Africa. In 1989, Soviet Deputy Foreign Minister Anatoly Adamishian met secretly in South Africa with the South African government to discuss normalization of relations. On 5th July 89, four and a half months after the Soviet army rolled out of Afghanistan, P.W. Borta, the president of the Republic of South Africa, walked across the floor of his office with his hand outstretched. With a big smile on his face, he shook the hand of his invited visitor. The visitor was none other than Nelson Mandela, the jailed figurehead of the ANC, decked out in a new suit, a tie with a neat double Windsor knot and nicely tied shoelaces. We've got the truth about Nelson Mandela on this channel. It's not a mere coincidence. The apartheid government started to open up negotiations with the ANC after the collapse of the Soviet Union. Those who understand the relationship between apartheid and communism wouldn't be shocked by this information. We already pointed out that the threat of communism was a significant factor in the institution of the apartheid regime after 1948. So communism has done no end of good in this world. So, what did the blacks want? What did the whites want? The people, not the people in power. It's very easy to mistake the white people at the top of the pyramid for the white people everywhere. In surveys administered between 1986 and 1989, two thirds of South Africa's whites indicated they preferred some sort of power sharing accommodation of blacks. The total white control option was rejected outright by the whites surveyed, even though they acknowledged quite candidly that they would expect to experience positive conditions and quality of life under a white controlled government and negative conditions and quality of life under a black controlled government. They still wanted to power share. Not bad. Certainly Afrikaners ceded control despite their negative expectation of black rule. More than 80% believed that the physical safety of whites would be threatened. Less than 10% believed that life would continue as before. Those 10% were probably packing their bags as they answered the survey. Far more revealing were the attitudes of ordinary black South Africans, also left out of the charmed circle that charted the constitutional future of South Africa. Only 35% of Soweto blacks in 1978 favored a government in which the blacks as the majority ruled the whites, compared to 57% of that sample preferring equal numbers of blacks and whites in the cabinet. And only 25% of urban black respondents approved of a black majority government. Soweto, by the way, is Southwest Township. Uh, I actually walked through there. It's uh, quite an interesting place. Only 25% of urban black respondents approved of a black majority government. See, blacks in South Africa are not just one big giant blob. They're all competing tribes and cultures and they oppose each other a lot and lots of conflict and friction and so on. So there's no such thing as a black majority government. Only 25% of the blacks wanted black majority rule. And lots of them, 57% wanted equal numbers of blacks and whites in the cabinet because they're not stupid. They know that if one race or the other race is permanently in control, corruption and horror is going to result. Well, rights, whites were certainly right about their life becoming more dangerous under black rule. Okay, I'm going to talk about this white farmer genocide. In South Africa, it's twice as dangerous to be a farmer as it is to be a police officer. Among farmers, the murder rate is 99 per 100,000, three times the murder rate of South Africa, which is already amongst the highest in the world. Since the overwhelming majority of farmers in the country are white, you've got to ask a pretty important question. Are these murders racially motivated? Despite the carnage in farmer communities since 2007, the South African police no longer report farmer deaths separately. Furthermore, race has been omitted from official death records since 1990. So getting an accurate picture of violence against whites has been made impossible by the authorities. And it's not very common that governments hide really great news. 
The British Telegraph commented, quote, What troubles many South Africans is the horrific and unnecessary violence that's a grim hallmark of farm attacks ostensibly staged to steal money. Blamed by some on resentment at the yawning gap between rich and poor, 40% unemployment in some rural areas, and the legacy of ill-feeling bequeathed by the former apartheid system. See, in the left, or according to the left, a woman wearing a bikini at a frat party who's drunk in no way, shape, or form ever invites sexual assault, which I quite agree with. But apparently, because there were whites in charge, it somehow justifies or explains away these murders of white people by blacks. Blame the victim, no. Blame the victim white, male, yes, good, good job. A memorandum by South African farmers noted, quote, these murders are marked by a unique level of brutality, often worse than that found in terrorist attacks. The argument that farm murders are only murder does not hold water. Let's um, look at an example. In 2012, the British Telegraph reported the horrific murder of Ati Potgeiter, a farm caretaker and his family. Mr. Potgeiter was stabbed 151 times with a garden fork, a knife, and a machete. His wife and three-year-old daughter were made to watch him die, after which the wife was shot in the head, execution style. The little girl was then taken to an outside room and shot in the back of the head. Her body was then carried back to the main bedroom where her mother lay dead. The potguiders were murdered on their 11th wedding anniversary. A note written in Bantu was left on the gate of the farm. We have killed them. We are coming back. What the murderers took was only pocket money and possessions of little value. Does this seem like a robbery to you? Some might find it odd that members of the South African ruling class have repeatedly been observed singing a song called Shoot the Boer. Boer refers to Afrikaners, which dates back to the pre-apartheid days of the country. In 2012, Jacob Zuma, the president of the country, was recorded singing this song, which contains the, within its lyrics lines like, Kill the farmer, kill the boer, which is basically, kill the white. The ruling party, the African National Congress, openly justifies the singing of this song. It even dismissed a court ruling that branded the song as unconstitutional hate speech. In 2012, to be fair, the ANC promised to stop singing the song to avoid hurting the feelings of the white farmers and inflaming racial tensions. I actually don't think it's the feelings that the white farmers are afraid of being hurt, but rather their heads with bullets. So imagine George Bush singing a Shoot the Blacks song. The media would explode in massive and justified condemnation. Yet when the president of South Africa sings Shoot the Boar, which coincides with the slaughter of many white farmers, there's barely a whisper in the West because, you see, we're just awash in white male privilege. In 1948, the South African National Party adopted a policy called the Broad-Based White Economic Empowerment Act. Among the objectives of the bills were the following key points. Increasing the number of white people that manage, own, and control enterprises and productive assets. Preferential procurement from enterprises that are owned or managed by white people. So we want more white people in charge and we only want to buy from white people. Achieving a substantial change in the racial composition of ownership and management structures and in the skilled occupations of existing and new enterprises. Does that bill seem kind of racist to you? Actually, I, to be fair, that bill was passed in 2003, actually called the Broad-Based Black Economic Empowerment Act, albeit it was replaced black with the word white in the text. If you suddenly feel that this legislation has become more favorable, congratulations, you now know that you are a racist. Robert Guest. Africa editor of The Economist had this to say about the broad-based black econ economic empowerment program. South Africa has embarked on probably the most extreme affirmative action program anywhere. Private companies above a certain size are obliged to try and make their workforces democratically, sorry, demographically representative, i.e. 75% black, 50% female, etc. From factory floor to boardroom. This is not a minor irritant like affirmative action in the US. The group which must be given preference constitutes a large majority. But because under apartheid blacks were deliberately deprived of education, there is a gaping shortage of blacks with commercially useful skills. Less than 2% of chartered accountants, for example, are black. 
This can only be fixed by improving schools. But the ANC's first impulse when it came to power was to try and raise the proportion of teachers who were black by paying a large number of the most experienced white teachers to retire. Scandalously, black pupils' exam results got worse in the early years after apartheid ended. They have since recovered, but still barely 1% of black high school students pass higher grade math, and very few opt for tough subjects at universities such as science or engineering. So, I mean, affirmative action, particularly in South Africa, is racist on so many levels. And in particular, it's saying, uh, blacks, you can't compete, so we've got to force white people to hire you. Why not just let blacks compete? That's how you get better, is you compete. Uh, but it is a, a racist measure because it basically says to blacks, you can't compete. And uh, nobody's going to give you a job because you're just not worth that much. Um, it's again, fixing the effects rather than allowing people to rise to the cause. In 2005, Newsweek reported between 1995 and 2000, average black household income shrank by 19% while that of whites and of the new black middle class rose by 15%. See, this is what I'm talking about. The black middle class was getting into power. The number of people living in absolute poverty has doubled since the ANC came to power in 1994, points out the Cato Institute. Opinion polls have revealed something that the media finds very uncomfortable. So given all this information that I'm presenting to you so far, you might not be wildly surprised to learn that South Africans often believe they were better off under apartheid. In 2002, the South African Independent Online reported, quote, overall, the polls showed that about 60% of South Africans felt the country was better run under apartheid, with both blacks and whites rating the current government less trustworthy, more corrupt, less able to enforce the law, and less able to deliver government services than its white predecessor. The surveys also found respondents giving more positive assessments of apartheid-era policies. But who listens to the people when there's moral outrage to spray across the continent and drown people in a sea of phlegm and bile and blood? So, herein after this is the end of facts and the beginning of opinion. These are just my thoughts. I hope that they will help you and make some kind of sense of this. So I first went to Africa when I was six, I went again when I was 16, and I argued in my teens, uh, 30 years ago, that it needed to be slow, it needed to be gradual, and there are things that you need to do to get people ready for power. You can't just jump people into the top of the pyramid and expect them to do anything other than fail. Look, there is a double standard, which is racist. It's hard to see. It's a double standard here. So the Bantu blacks moved in for the North based on superior technology. They won the battle and ended up ruling the country. Okay, that's what happens in history. Look, cultures that are aggressive and cultures that have better technology, they win. The Bantus did it, and much more harshly to the native black population of South Africa, the Bantus did it, and then the British and the Dutch came along, and they did it too, even if we accept the general narrative as true, or there's doubts about it, but let's just say it's all true. So the blacks come in and kill a lot of people with superior technology, nobody even talks about it. The whites come in and do exactly the same thing, and it's, oh my God, the worst horrifying thing that has ever happened. The population of blacks under apartheid tripled. The population of the native black population did not exactly triple under the Bantus. So the fact that a culture moves in with superior technology and wins, yeah, it happens. That's called history. Deal with it. Because there's this giant problem. In sub-Saharan Africa, I've had two experts come on to talk about this. James Flynn, Professor James Flynn, and Professor Kevin Beaver. We'll put the links to them below. Here's the big problem in sub-Saharan Africa. You have an average IQ of about 70 to 75. Maybe 80 a little bit. Well, that's really bad. That is almost two standard deviations below the European average. You cannot run a first world country with a whole bunch of people with voting and political power rights when they've got an IQ of 70 to 75. An IQ of 70 is a borderline mentally retarded in the West. It doesn't work. You have to find ways to raise this average IQ. 
Nobody knows exactly how. I've had some thoughts, as you can imagine. Uh, peaceful parenting, negotiating with children. Blacks are very strong with corporal punishment. Stop doing that. Breastfeed for longer. Blacks breastfeed very little in general. All of these things will do a lot to help raise IQ, in my humble opinion. Lord, we all hope it's not genetic. Nobody knows for sure. Very few people are, have the courage to study this stuff. When <clears throat> the whites, when the Westerners came across South Africa or Africa as a whole, there were no written, South Africa, no written language. They hadn't invented the wheel. They'd never built a two-story building. It was not super advanced. And it takes time. It takes time to move things up. So until we can deal with, acknowledge this problem of, of IQ and, and the need to raise it in order to have a more civilized country, not going to work. And doing it too quickly before raising this IQ provides more ammunition to racists who can now point to South Africa and say, oh, look, another failed black state. You show me a successful black city. You show me a successful black country puts more ammunition into their hands because you didn't wait for the black middle class to emerge. Because the leftists had to come in, the communists had to come in, and the morally self-righteous people had to come in and scream racism and, oh, look, you're being a moral hero by calling Afrikaners racist. What has happened since? You unbelievable ass clowns. What has happened since? That's blood on your hands. This terrible knee-jerk response that people have, Black failure, white scapegoat. Black failure, white scapegoat. It's like people don't even think about it. It just happens. But to say whenever you come across black dysfunction to blame whites is incredibly racist. And I, I, I'll give you a way of understanding that so it makes sense to you. If you come across a white racist and he says, well, in America, he says, well, I'm frightened of and, and angry at and hate blacks because of such high criminality in the black population. Okay, well, there is high criminality in the black population. Would you say to that person, your dysfunctionality is the fault of blacks? You are justified. You are excused. No, we wouldn't say that. We'd say, no, this is kind of judge all blacks. But, uh, racist, it's bad, right? So there, white dysfunction called racism, you can't blame on blacks, even though there are some facts that back up some of that fear. On the other hand, when you come across black dysfunction, you just blame whites and excuse blacks. That's racist. Hold blacks up to the same standards that you hold whites up to. Otherwise, you're a racist. I shouldn't even need to say this. With this white guilt, I'm with Shelby Steele, black writer on this. I mean, white guilt is this horrible environmental toxin. It's become like this new Catholicism. You've got the original sin, sin called being white and being racist and institutional this and structural this and blah, 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 blah. It's unconscious. You don't even, I don't know. Can't find an individual white racist. It's okay. It's institutional. It's everywhere. It's in the air. This is terrible because what it does is it installs a big money button on white people. Push the white guilt button. Get money. Push the white guilt button. Get foreign aid. Get affirmative action. Get reparations. Get a get bang, 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 bang. It's crippling. Stop feeling guilty. You never owned slaves. Only two and a half percent of whites ever owned slaves in America. And most whites hated slavery because it drove down the wages of white workers and they were conscripted. They were conscripted to go and hunt slaves, which they didn't want to do. Remember Jagermeister and sheep at the end of a long day. And when I was uh, in my teens, I had no money to go to university. I was able to go to university in South Africa. My father worked there. But I would have had to go into the army. That's not free. The whites didn't like apartheid, the white population in general, particularly the young white men, because you had to, on the 18th birthday, you'd got to show up and go get paid $15 a month going out to fight for the white government. And if you didn't show up, you got thrown in jail for four years. Yay, white privilege. So, White people stop feeling guilty. You can't feel proud that white Western Christian civilization ended slavery. You didn't do it. But for God's sakes, don't feel guilty. Everybody was a slave owner. Nobody was a slave owner. It doesn't matter. That was the human history. That's what happened to everyone. Just don't feel guilty. 
because feeling guilty makes you lower your standards and that perpetuates dysfunction. The soft bigotry of low expectations is the most noxious and subtle environmental toxin that people have to deal with. Nobody knows how to transplant cultures. Nobody knows how to take, say, Western history and transplant it to another culture. This idea that you go and bomb the crap out of Iraq and then you get a Western style democracy as if they just had 2,500 years of history that led to that, never gonna happen. You can, I think, encourage people to, to think better, to think more critically, to study more, to learn more, to know more, and I think that makes people better. Nobody knows how to transplant cultures. Can't do it. It's a slow multi-generational process that mostly has to do with convincing parents to be better parents. And I've got the case throughout this show if you want to listen to more on that. But the most horrifying thing is just this missed opportunity that you had a chance to build a highly functional first world black society. Again, assuming that the dysfunctions are not genetic, no proof that they are, let's just act as if it's not, it's the best we can do. You had the chance to build a highly functional first world black society, but you needed to grow the middle class first. And when you teach blacks to hate whites, you teach blacks to throw the baby out with the bathwater because there's, yeah, there's stuff to dislike about whites, a lot of great stuff that whites have brought to the table of Western and world civilization as well. And so when all these people came elbowing in all these decades ago and screaming racism and demanding that it end and creating their rap junkie songs and all that, you uh, have produced this. Actions have consequences. That which you advocate and bring into being, you are responsible for. This tragically missed opportunity, this gaping and opening hellhole of a failing and failed society this baby rape, this incredible prevalence and prevalence of HIV and AIDS, this murder rate, this, this incredible road fatalities, this disintegrating society didn't have to be that way. I don't know if it can be turned around. I don't know. But I do know, this I know for sure, that if we don't know the facts, we can never be in control of the future. If we don't know the past, we have no idea where we're heading. I aim and hope to bring the facts to you. I try to keep as little bias in this as possible. I try to be as honest about difficult subject as possible. Can it be turned around? I don't know. But I know until we know the facts, any recovery from this imminent disaster is functionally and practically impossible. So please like, subscribe and share this information. And if you like and find what we're doing here valuable, please support the team that produced this. freedomainradio.com slash donate. Thank you so much for watching.